This morning I want to share something with you as we cross over from one series to the next. You know, I want to talk, we just got through talking about destiny and how important destiny is in our lives. And I want you to, uh, remi- I want to remind people that might be here for the very first time for several, actually several weeks, maybe even months, we were talking about not only discovering and fulfilling your destiny, But that a believer's destiny, a Christian's destiny, is a different destiny. And we talked about from Romans chapter 8, verse 30, 29, it says, We have been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's dear Son. Can I have an amen? Amen. And then verse 30 goes on to say, and says, "For uh, For those he chose beforehand, he called them to a different destiny. Can you say different destiny? And we began to share in the last several weeks of what that different destiny was all about. Because of Jesus, our destiny is different. Not just different for the sake of different, but absolutely eternal and important and significant for every life in this this world. And so I wanted to share with you, because we've been talking about destiny. One of the things that I said last week, when I was talking about God's dream, God's vision, and God's desire, and that is that, God is a God of visions and dreams. And he deposits those visions and dreams in our hearts because it's his vision, it's his dream, it's his desire put in our hearts so that we would carry out his vision, his dream, and his desire on this earth. Give me a better amen or a woe is me. I'm going to help you here. And so I want you to understand because God's dream, as we said in the beginning of this rolling, God's dream is an answer for a generation. But it's a generation that is waiting for an answer. And this is what I want to talk to you about. Last week we talked about how you and I are the answer. We the church are the answer. Say, I am an answer. In Christ, I am an answer. Say, I have the answer. Now we know that Jesus is ultimately the answer, but what I want you to understand is we rolled in on that video, is that the people that were illustrated represent the faces of humanity. Let's call them the people of the harvest fields. These are people that God loves. This is why Jesus Christ uh, was sent here by the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We can appropriately even say it this way. God so loved the harvest fields that he saw us in those fields and he sent his only begotten son. Can I have an amen? Amen. So the people there represented on the screen are global people. It's not everybody, but it gives you a good picture. And they represent the people that God loves unconditionally. People like you, people like me, people like us. And the only difference between possibly them on the screens and you and I is that they're still waiting for an answer. You see, we say, what answer? Well, the answer that Jesus has for every person. You see, every one of you or every one of us, if we're born again, meaning not just if we go to a church building, but if we're truly born again, that can only happen in Christ Jesus, we were all found in the harvest field. Because the harvest field is in one location. It was what God used to try to explain humanity and what he came to do for humanity, and that is to make them whole to make them complete, to save them, to restore them, to bring peace into them and joy into them. Can I have an amen? Amen. And so, see, they're waiting to come out of the harvest field as Jesus defined the harvest field. In Matthew chapter 9, for example, verse 35 to 37, it goes up on the screens. Could you all read it with me? One, two, three, read. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and the villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. And when he looked out over the crowds, the multitudes, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. Now, This is where we kind of left off last week. But I want you to remember that, you know, he wants, he came to the harvest fields. He was ministering in the harvest fields, but he was talking about humanity. He was talking about people like you and people like me and people like us. 
And I want you to realize that he has such a love. His heart broke because it was filled with compassion toward us. Because God's love is what really heals us. God so loved the world that he gave his best. He gave his son. And his love is not to be compared to any other kind of love. But it's his love is the beginning point of absolute, total healing and making us whole. And so this is what I want you to understand. That many people, for example, in the harvest field, um, don't understand that Jesus is the answer for the problem that they might be blind to that they don't even know requires a solution. I mean, let me just speak of myself. I mean, I was, you know, I grew up religiously. I grew up in church. I grew up with all those good things. I went to a great uh, university, had a great degree in architecture. And I was, uh, you know, I was, but there was something always missing. You know, and I thought because I tried the religious thing that it, that was, but it wasn't that. I didn't have a relationship. But I didn't know that. So I knew something was missing. And the reason I want you to kind of understand this is because God wants you and I to be part of the harvest fields. He wants you and I to remember where you and I came from. He wants you to remember how he walked amongst the harvest fields and he brought healing to bruised and hurt lives. He said, well, but I'm not Jesus, Pastor Art. You know, I know the Bible says that Jesus was without measure, but you have a measure, and together, all of us together make a greater measure. Because we say greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And I want you to know that the Bible says that you and I have been called to be ministers and dispensers. Now, I want you to understand this, that song that, um, that we just heard. It was a, actually, it's an old song. Some of you might remember Steve Winwood. I don't. It was before my time. But anyways, anyways he's the one who he originally wrote it. It was, it was remixed and redone uh, and was sung by a, uh, a gentleman by the name of James Vincent McMorrow. And that's not the point. The point is, in that song, when it was written, it was almost a sound that you can find in the harvest fields. What do you mean by that? Let me try to put a picture together for you here. It, it was a sound that you can hear even today. It's a sound that I know, without doubt, God does not want the church to turn a deaf ear to. It's the sound that you and I once had. Where we're asking the questions, is this all there is? And they could be asked in so many different ways. But some of the, part of the verse is this. It says, the song is called A Higher Love, but it says, think about it. There must be a higher love down in the heart or hidden in the stars. Without it, life is wasted time. Look inside your heart. I'll look inside mine. It goes on to say, we walk blindly, we try to see, falling behind in what could be. Then he says, the chorus says, bring me a higher love, bring me a higher love. Where's that higher love I keep thinking about? One more line from a verse, it says, in this song he says, it's a yearning and it's real for me. There must be someone who's feeling for me, bring me a higher love. And the reason I bring this out to you is because, like you and I, what is missing? We sometimes think, well, we don't know what it is, and we think it's a better job, or it's a different person, or it's a different location, and, and uh, there's nothing per se wrong with those things, but that is not what makes us whole. It doesn't make us complete. And Jesus is not a higher love. Jesus is the highest love. He's not to be compared with some image or icon or something like that. Because Jesus' love is the highest because his love is unfailing and it's unconditional. And it's all forgiving and it's all redeeming. It restores, it remakes, it rebuilds, and it fills. Come on, somebody. And I want you to realize it's not momentary, it's not temporary, it's permanent. It's, it will change your life and turn your world right side up. God not only has love, the Bible says God is love. And it's important that you and I understand that the harvest fields, of course, the answer is Jesus. But for you and I, the church, to know that the answer is Jesus, but to forget about the harvest fields, we gotta, you have to remember that there was a day that you and I were in the harvest fields, 
And, uh, you know, it could have been where someone shared with you or began to share with you about how, what the need was in our life. And maybe we were going through something, um, whatever it might have been. Maybe the harvest field where you were located was where you worked, or maybe it was in the school you went to, or maybe it was in the community you now live in, or maybe it was in a group of people that you used to hang with, or, you know, whatever it is. The harvest field is just humanity. But in that humanity, when Jesus came, he came for people because he loved people. His motive was not religion, and his motive was not rituals, and his motive was not condemnation, and it was, certainly wasn't guilt. It was all motivated by love. And it was an amazing love. And the church must not forget that. And we can turn a blind eye and get so caught up. And it's wonderful, absolutely amazing for us to enjoy everything that Christ has done for us. But remember, it's because you know the answer. But there's a world that doesn't know the answer. And we forget that that was us not too long ago. And when our heart, we must not allow our heart to become disconnected. We must not allow our heart because what's the dream of the Father's heart and the destiny of every believer is to harvest fields. And I know sometimes, I know we all kind of feel inadequate. We feel like, how can I? Well, it's not you. It's God working through you. But God does need your faith. And I want you to realize his love is unfailing. It's unconditional. You know, the second thing I'd like to point out is this song, of course, called Higher Love. Not that I'm trying to advocate the song here in any way or promote it. I mean, it, it, again, I repeat to you, it, it's a voice that the church does not want to turn a deaf ear to. You know, it's a sound coming from the harvest fields. And they're asking a question. And they are asking how to be made whole. They're asking, that's what this person's singing wrote it like in 86 or something like that, taking it back to the day. But anyways, and, and you know, and it doesn't sound what Christianese, does it? And it doesn't sound religious, does it? And it doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? And it, it's very easy for the church to begin to judge a song like that. You know, not that you ever would. Of course not, God be, you know, forbid. But the point is, doesn't sound very deep. Doesn't sound very churchy, but it's very, very real. It's a sound that you and I can remember, we can recall, and we can really relate to. Because it's the cry of the heart. Whether it's done in a beautiful song with an incredible melody, or it's done in some kind of poem, or it's written in a book, or it's spoken amongst words or amongst friends, it is still a cry that you and I can remember. And you don't want to forget that. Because I know you can remember and I think that's the point, is God's love is just full of forgiveness. And God's forgiveness that comes through you and I is God's love expressed in an unconditional manner. And this is what I want you to know, that it's God's love that will make us whole. You know, one thing I, I do know, and it's without doubt, that the people of the harvest field are waiting to be made whole. They, they might not know it. They might not know how to say it. They might not know how to articulate. They might not be as fanciful as, as some other people who are deep-rooted and not wrong in scripture and biblical knowledge or just have come up in different environments. But there is a cry where they want to be made whole and they might sound really rough and they might sound a little bit on the crass side, but it's beautiful to God when somebody can reach up and say, I want to be made whole. They might call it a higher love. And you might sit here and scorn and say, well, they just don't know it's Jesus. Well, no, they don't know it's Jesus because you and I haven't told them it's Jesus. But it's not because there's something wrong with you. We just have to remember that we have got to tell them the answer because they're waiting for an answer like you and I were waiting for an answer which wasn't too long ago. And we didn't even know we needed that answer until somebody came by and said, is that an answer that I need? And they said, yes, it's an answer you need because it's that answer that will make you whole. And so, you know, this is why I want us to remember that the passage of Matthew chapter 9 is Jesus saying, we need more workers to go into the harvest fields. And I'll empower you and I'll anoint you and I will gift you and I will tell you what to say, but we must go. God has always used a man or a woman to go into the harvest fields. 
But why is it that the church is so easy to forget the people we used to be? And so I think by the Spirit of God, and believe me in prayer, I want this to be the breath of God on you because we want to have the mind of Christ and hold the thoughts and the feelings and the purposes of his heart. And not of religious ways. There's nothing wrong with church at all. It's absolutely amazing. God loves his church. Because God loves his church because the church should know his heart. He compels us to go into the highways and byways to compel people to come in that his house may be filled. Why? For number's sake, no, because he loves humanity. He loves the harvest fields. He loves you and I because we all were born out of the harvest fields. Come on, give Jesus a great big hand clap because that's why I say this is about God's dream and our destiny. Yeah, I understand you might have a different vocation. I understand you might have a different, I get that. But the foundation of your Christianity that is eternal and forever is the fact that we're all about the harvest fields. Whether you're in the corporate office or in some medical field or science field, some digital field or, you know, some performing arts field, that's all wonderful. That's just your mission field where God has placed you. But you must never forget church. Oh, church, we must never forget the harvest fields. Because that's where we came out of. There's not one mover or shaker in the body of Christ, even in history, since the resurrection of Jesus. There's not one mover or shaker, theologian, history maker, however it might be that you esteem them and value them and important they have been to history that did not but come out of the harvest fields. Everyone came out of the harvest fields. That's where God found us. Because he saw the harvest fields and it was once your name and my name and our name and the names of others and the name of those yet to be. And I want you to understand that's what makes this life so exciting because we're partnering with Jesus. Amen. So Jesus went into the harvest field to make people whole. He wants you whole. He wants me whole. He wants us whole. He wants you know, the curse of the adversary brings broken off of our lives. He wants to see you live a redeemed life. He wants to see you live set free and full of joy because that's the price that he paid for you to have. And right now people are frustrated maybe in those harvest fields and, and they're struggling in certain areas. But God is a God who heals. And the beautiful thing of the gospel is that it is amazing news. It is not just good news. It is amazing because it is the best news that any person, under any condition, facing any situation, no matter how insurmountable or how impossible, how unthinkable, Jesus always is the answer to make people whole. Amen? And so we need to remember that. Let me remind you of a story that, that maybe um, you're familiar with, and it's a story of the woman with the issue of blood as I get ready to wrap this thing down and set it headed for home. And there's a, a verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, where Jesus is speaking, because Jesus spoke in King James, you know, he speaks, he says, Jesus said unto her, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. It would say that. Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. You know, Jesus looks, this is a typical person who did not know the answer. But when she heard about Jesus, she heard the answer. Oh, y'all don't hear what I say. This woman was not a bad woman. She, did, she made decisions based on the knowledge that she had. So she used all of her money for 12 years trying to get a remedy through medical science or whatever it was. And she spent all that she had went for all of their philosophies, but wasn't made any better. And there was a point in her life where she heard about Jesus, and Jesus turned to her and said, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. And it says, it says there, um, yeah, receive your peace and, and walk in your wholeness. And I think it's important that you and I understand that the word wholeness is the word, of course, I like this word because it's the word sozo, in the Bible, or it's the all-encompassing word for salvation. 
And that word uh, means everything from being saved to being restored to being preserved to being protected to being prospered to having peace. I mean, it's all complete. When Jesus comes to save you, he doesn't come just to plop you in a church. He comes to make you whole. Say, God wants me whole. That's right, he does. He really does. And I'm stirring your faith because today, Jesus is going to make you whole. You say, how can you say that? Want to hear it again? Jesus is going to make you whole. That's how I can say it because I have the mic. Anyways, and, and I believe what I'm saying. But I want you to hear what I'm saying here in just a moment. The word whole, if you look it up in the Webster's Dictionary, it simply means to be healthy, to be unhurt, to be recovered, to be restored, to be free from defects, to be uh, free from any impairment or any disease. Wow, isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's what it is to make whole. And so, in essence, I guess we can say when Jesus was talking to that woman with the issue of blood, he could have said something like, Daughter, thy faith has made thee healthy, unhurt, you know, uh, recovered or restored. That's right, because God can restore you right now. God can help you to recover right now. God can make you healthy right now. God can take away the hurt now. Because he is the God who comes to make you whole. He comes to make you whole. You know, another, I guess another way it could be said is, Daughter, thy faith has made thee free from defects. How many of you feel like you have too many defects? Don't raise your hands. You know, or you have some impairments. I mean, I, I will raise my hands right now. You know, we kind of grow up religiously thinking that, you know, you got to have skills and you got to have talents to be accepted by everybody. And for some people, that's the way their world is. The world revolves around what you can do for me. But for Jesus, there's nothing we can do for him. We just receive him. Come on, somebody, help me out here. And I want you to realize that, that God wants us free from any disease, not only physical ailments in your body, but any disease. Do you have a, a disease or something not at ease in your life? You see, the whole world is searching for wholeness. And yes, you can look at this world, and you'll have plenty of examples of people who are popular icons right now in, in, in many media outlets, or maybe Hollywood stars and idols, admired and, and sung after, and there's nothing wrong with that, or rock stars, as you and I would call them, or people that you would call movers and shakers, whether in the Christian world or in the secular world, and, uh, or fantastically rich and famous type people. Again, and they have the evidences of success. But I can guarantee, I promise you this. I promise you that if they don't know Jesus, they are not whole. Because Jesus is the only one can make you whole. You can have all the money and I'll not have a good marriage. That's right. You know, you can have a great marriage, and that's wonderful. We want all that to be good. God is not saying, you know, don't try to make our lives good. But I want you to realize that you're not completely whole without Jesus. I mean, you might have a skill base that you might be leaning on right now, a talent or gift that you might really be leaning on, or you might feel your bank account is just feeling kind of good right now. And that's wonderful. I wouldn't want it to be any other way. But the point is, that doesn't make you whole. Your good looks don't make you whole. Sometimes trying to cover up the looks that you have, trying to make you look good, is why you have a whole. H-O-L-E. And see, this is what I want you to understand is I'm not picking on people's successes. I applaud them for their accomplishments. But you need to understand this, that those accomplishments don't make you whole. Jesus is the only one who can make you whole. And that's not a religious statement. I don't have to apologize. And I will not just say it inside the church house. I said it outside. And I continue to say that if you want to be complete, if you want to be put together, you need Jesus in your life. And oftentimes people say, well, I don't need Jesus. I have this car and I have that house. And I have this amount of money. And that's not what I'm talking about. Because without him, there is something that's unhealthy on the inside of you. And it might not be in the dimension that I understand. It might not be something that you will reveal to me and not that I would have to know. But he knows all things and he's not trying to pick on you. He's just trying to make you whole. So many people try to play in this world, right? They try to play the game, play up to other people because there's a hole in their hearts and they know they're not whole. So they try these things to try to cover up the hole. I call it a hole in their soul. And you know what? In every person without Jesus, there's a God-sized void. 
There's a void in every heart of every person in the harvest fields that only in that space is room for Jesus. You cannot put another relationship in there that can take its place. And some of you have tried, you tried this relationship after that relationship, after this adjustment, after that adjustment. And it's great. I don't want you to be, of course, and God doesn't want you to be sad, but they cannot make you whole. They never will make you whole. Only Jesus can make you whole. And I might be challenging your mindset, and I'm glad I'm here. Because the thing is this, inside again, every person is a God-shaped void. A home that can only be filled with Jesus Christ. Let me show you. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I want you to read this out loud with me. It goes up on the screens right now. Uh, not so quick. Hit the button, please. Thank you. It says this. Ready? Read with me. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, body, and keep you fit for the coming of the master, Jesus Christ. Well, that's what it was supposed to say. Uh, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. I know how it's written. It was written wrong. Uh, I don't say that to criticize. It says, it says um, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. So what did he say? He said he wants the harvest fields, people, to be made whole. And the woman with the issue of blood, he said, well, that's not my issue. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you don't have an issue. You know, and the thing is this, God wants you made whole. And if you ever want to go back, you can read this entire story, which I'm not going to do a breakdown because of time. Um, you can read it from Mark chapter 5, verse 25 through, uh, I think it's 34. But I do want to give you a part of this story, and then I want to close. Because I think that her issue, her issue was a blood issue. It was a physical issue. But there are many issues, much more issues than I can even begin to list that people have, that Jesus wants people whole from, complete, put together. When things fall apart, only Jesus can put it together. When hearts are broken, only he can put it together. That's why he tells us we don't have to live bitter. And we don't have to live in unforgiveness. And we don't have to live sad. And we don't have to live mad. And we don't have to live judgmental. And we don't have to live marked and tainted. You know, and scoured in sorrow. You know, with sorrow. And I want you to realize why. Why is that possible, Pastor? Because his love will make you whole. You know, when someone presented Christ to you, what they presented is a God who loves you. And they said, well, he loves me. I don't even love me. How could he love me? Because he loves you unconditionally. He just loves you with no conditions. Maybe that story that we saw just a moment ago gives you just a little inkling of how passionately God loves you. How passionately he's in love with you if you were like the only person. Some of you say, oh, I wish I had an Agnes. Well, you have something better than Agnes. You have a Jesus. And I just want you to understand his love will not fail you. His love is what comforts you. Even when you fall and scrape your spiritual kneecaps, he's there to pick you up and he's there to breathe life into you because he wants you whole. He doesn't want you marked. He doesn't want your knees, spiritual kneecaps skinned. He doesn't want you scarred. He doesn't want you in any way tainted. He's a God that will make you whole. And I just want you to understand that. You know, do you have an issue, like the woman with the issue of blood, that somehow is challenging you, that's keeping you from God's best? Hers with an issue of blood. You know, is there something that maybe is keeping you from living victoriously, or maybe something that's keeping you from really enjoying life, or something that you're always trying to bury, but it seems to pop up again? You know, you know, it, you know it's... It could be in an area of marriage. It could be in an area of family. It could be in an area of relationships. It could be with your children. It could be with your parents. It could be in a financial area. It could be in your career. 
It could be with somebody on the job. It could be with something that happened years ago that you're still carrying in your heart. You know, it could be an addiction. It could be so many other things. I cannot exhaust the list that's there, but let me remind you of this. No matter what it is, he wants you whole from it. He wants you healed from it. He's the God who can make you holy and whole. He wants you together, spirit, soul, and body. Isn't that good news? That is such good news. And so, and so I, I remind you of this before I close. And um, my second close, I think, or my last. This is the key for the woman with the issue of blood. Though she had an issue, and for, for a season there, she kind of piled up her issues. We don't know whether she ever was religious, whether ever she went to the synagogue, doesn't really say that or not. But, but the point is, when she heard about Jesus, she didn't hear about the religion that was well stated in her country, or the, or the nation of Israel. But she heard about Jesus. She didn't hear about religion. She heard about Jesus. She didn't hear about a ritual. She heard about Jesus. She didn't hear about uh, works that you have to do to be accepted. She heard about Jesus. She didn't hear about perfection. She heard about Jesus. Somebody told her about Jesus. Somehow she heard the answer. Come on, somebody. All, all she did is hear the answer. And this is the beauty of verse 27. It says, and when she had heard about Jesus. Everyone say she heard about Jesus. Say it again, please. Say it like you've already had Starbucks. Come on. Uh, oh, there you go. You're, you're on the Jamba Juice level. Like you had Starbucks, double shot, going strong. Come on. She heard. There you go. See, when she heard about Jesus, you know, this is important. Um, she came in the press behind, the Bible says, and touched his garment. You know, I'm not going to go into a lot of theology, but the, 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 the hem of his garment has been, um, it's a type and shadow in, in theology, meaning in biblical studies, uh, what was supposed to represent the finished work of Jesus. And uh, just remember finished work. Say finished work. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is what? It is finished. And when he rose from the dead, he sealed the finished work. Come on, somebody. And I want you to realize this is a type and shadow of any person who will reach out to Jesus and touch his finished work. His finished work will always touch you back. And it will make you whole. She had an issue that no man, no science, no medical, um, astute individual, intellectual, phil philosophical theorist about life, you know, could have resolved in her life. You know, but when she touched Jesus and she let Jesus touch her, she was made whole. And the, the scripture is in there not because of a lady. Do you know most of the great men in the Bible are women? Some of the women didn't even catch that one. The men are going like, what? You don't make any sense. You'll catch it tomorrow morning at lunch. Anyways, it says... For she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. You know, and what, what did it mean for her to touch? The Bible says, that Jesus gave her the answer, your faith, woman. Now, you're not your faith in your gift or faith in your doctors or faith in, she was, Jesus did not put her down for wrong decisions, for spending her money. Jesus didn't say, you know, you could have brought that money to the temple. Or Jesus didn't say, you know, you, know you, you could have done something with that for poor people. Or Jesus didn't, no, he just didn't even consider her past. He just simply said, I felt power flow out of me. And the only thing that activated that power is her faith in Jesus. And that same Jesus then is the same Jesus now. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? And the good thing is I wrap this thing up, third close. As I wrap this thing up is this. The harvest fields haven't heard the answer. And even though we love Jesus' touch, how many of you know that we're a continuing work being done? We're like on the potter's wheel, and we're still spinning around. Thank God his fingerprints are all over you. Amen?
His handprints are falling. <laughs> Say, you know, the next time somebody says, you know, you're not that perfect as a Christian. Says, I know, God's still working on me. He's still, he's still molding me, so keep working. Me. See me tomorrow. I'll be a little bit better than I was today. And see me the next week because I'll be a little bit better than the week before. Because <laughs> he's still working on me. Hey, there's no shame in my game. I'm the first to tell you I'm still being worked on. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. Some of you, um, anyways, I lost you right there. But let's all stand to our feet. Did you receive something this morning?